giving it time to start, and then <laughs> we can continue. All right, well, it says we're live, so here we go. Um, as the title does suggest, we're going to talk a lot about what Miami's offense is probably – what Miami's do. offense should do when the Quincy Perry is starting. But not going to do. And whether or not they'll do it, I guess, remains to be seen. But we're just going to kick it off with something completely different um, than what we're probably going to wind up talking about. We're going to talk about the um, California last week at some point. I think it was – Last Monday? Two, yeah, last Monday or Tuesday. Um, their uh, government, I guess – signed into effect the California Pay-to-Play Act, which means that um, amateur players, such as college players specifically, will get paid for their name and their likeness. But it is also worth noting that this was not taken effect until um, 20, 20, the 2023-24 to 24 school season. Um, and we don't even know if this is like an opt-in kind of thing, like – because the NCAA says that if you participate in this thing, as of now, you are kicked out of the NCAA. Um, what that exactly means, we don't really know. But what it for sure means is you can't play in any bowl games. And I would assume the playoff at this point. If, you know, if you're USC or UCLA, you probably can't play in the playoff. They said it gives you an unfair advantage. Um, so we don't really know the finer details because they, they said that would be their five-year plan, essentially, is to – iron out the details and figure out what they really want to do with this bill and what they want their kids to ultimately get out of it and what they can and cannot get. So I am very much for this thing. Um, I know a lot of people aren't because they consider school in their food, their payment. They get to go to school for free. But it's like when you think about it, how different is that from what the high school sector is like? You get to go to high school for free. If you don't make a good enough income, you could get free lunch. Yeah. Like, they're just essentially just paying for two more meals. And although it is a higher education, and it is a, you know, you could do a lot more with an actual degree. But to an extent, these better D1 players, who would ultimately this would affect, that doesn't matter anyway. Yeah, I mean, I see positives and negatives into it. Um, I <laughs> There's so much to talk about it. Yeah. Um, you're going to start seeing kids with agents coming in their, their freshman year. Yeah, that's the main thing is they allow uh, kids to sign agents and have agents in college. Yeah, and I think as long as they, you know, as long as you're a freshman, you're, you're let's say you're a five-star player, mm -hmm. as long as you get a good agent, you're going to make a yeah. killing. But I guess what this – I'll just say I think it's a congressman in North Carolina – has come forth and said that he wants this to be a federal, federally regula regulated. Why well, was that so difficult? Re uh, regulated thing by the government that says these kids can be paid for their name and likeness. Where does that extend, and how much can they make, or yeah. whatever? Like this needs to be the entire nation. I don't think that'll happen because the NCAA is one of the most corrupt organizations in the entire world. So. Uh, if you're a Miami fan, you know why. The Miami fans – so Miami got in trouble a couple years ago, like yeah. maybe 10 years ago now yeah. with Nevin Shapiro. Um, he was buying players meals. He was uh, he was a technical booster because he was buying uh, – he pays for the scholarship. So Miami doesn't get state funding because they're a right. private school. Right. So they have people that fund money in to basically give these athletic scholarships out. Right. And he was – these kids mentor like I paid for your scholarship like I'm your guy you come to um if there's a problem with what's happening at school right and uh because it's not an essential it's not a scholarship it's just they're paying for it right but it, it ultimately it is yeah and anyway he was paying for players meals he was you know all that stuff he was breaking a lot of rules yeah. so anyway while he was in prison he was in prison for uh white collar scams like he was do a lot of money laundering um telephone scams medicare scams all this stuff and 
the NCAA was hiring his lawyer to then feed them information. And so the case got thrown out by from by the NCAA because they decided that the, the, the federal government cited that the NCAA had lack of constitutional control through the whole situation. So what they were using, they were using the lawyer to what they were doing in his actual court case to then preside with the NCAA. Wow. Which ultimately it was all true, but it still was against practice. Yeah. And um, they threw the whole case out and gave Miami like a three scholarship ban for like four years, three years. So Miami got like a slap on the wrist saying, we know you did it, but we just can't say you did. Anyway, so all that to say, the NCAA is a very corrupt organization. So they're going to keep all the money they can. Yeah. Because they ultimately are the ones that make money off of it. And I'm not sure what you'll wind up seeing. What I want is for Texas and Florida to join in on this specifically. Apparently Pennsylvania jumped right on it the day after. Yeah, which it's Pennsylvania. Um, Pennsylvania's a pretty hotbed for recruiting. Yeah, this uh, this is from CBS News. The NCAA brought in more than one billion dollars last year from TV rights and championship ticket sales. I mean, yeah, I would see it. The way I see it is, you have California, who is one of your top three recruiting beds in all of the world for talent. Then you have Texas, and then you have Florida. Those are your three states where I would say 90% of your athletes are from. In football, and I would say basketball, it very much it's varies. Yeah. But football, it's Texas, it's Florida, it's California. California is on the boat. And then you have schools like a powerhouse like Texas, the University of Texas. They're like, hey, we've got all the boosters in the world. They literally have Matthew McConaughey is on staff yeah. at oh, the college, teaches. and it's like he and even even USC that, even uh, USC film program yeah. yeah even USC look at all the film producers and all that that went to um, Lucas George Lucas yeah. went to uh, USC Steven Spielberg went to USC like there's all the look at what USC has brought out in terms of film look at what the University of Texas alone has in just money in general yeah. And well, I mean, if you look at states-wise, California is the richest, obviously. Yeah. So the amount of backers that you would have in California, we're talking about, we're talking about transfers from Florida now. Mm-hmm. You're you're going to see kids going from Miami, yeah. in high school, at going the current straight state. to USC. Yeah, on the current state, yeah. Just everybody. Mm-hmm. So, so if this passes and it just is for California, mm-hmm. California is going to be unstoppable as far as football because. We'll just go for California at the rate that it is at the moment. It, they're the only state. They say, hey, we're USC. We'll give you so many autograph sessions, and we'll pay you X amount of money. We'll guarantee you five autograph sessions if you come to USC. You won't get to play in a bowl game. You may not get to play in the playoff, but you'll make money, and you'll definitely, at the current state, as California is the only state, you will be one of the – most popular people in the entire country. Yeah. Because I mean, everybody be, will be talking about you. You're going to be in commercials, whether it's mm-hmm. Nike or Adidas or whoever. Well, look at the way everybody talked about Tate Martell coming from Ohio State to Miami. Tate Martell was a, was a very popular person yeah. on social media and everything. And everybody was talking about him. And the fact that he moved to receiver, everybody was talking about that. And this kid makes no money. Yep. From the, he probably doesn't need it, but it's like it's still – there are kids they talk about all the time and use their name and their likeness, such as Jalen Hurts, Tua Tagovailoa, yeah. Justin Fields. Like They talk about those three guys all day, every day on College Football Live. Yeah. And they get to make no money off of it. And so then you have you know, Steven Spielberg, and you become like, hey, we'll give you an extra in a movie. Like We'll put you in the background. We'll credit you if you just come to USC. Oh, you know what? I didn't even think about that. So – so let's say you're uh, your agent and player. You know you have an agent. You have rights. Mm-hmm. Could we even? Uh, we couldn't even really show their plays without their permission. So like if you have a QB that's playing for USC that ha- that has a contract, and he has rights to his name to his image. Yeah. ESPN's got to contact his agent and say, hey, we want to show your your plays on ESPN. Well, it's it's like um, have you. 
heard of that gymnast? She went to UCLA. Her name is like Caitlin Ohashi no. or or Shawnee, something like that. Um, she is a gymnast, and she has essentially become the LeBron James of gymnastics, where she's not like the best like LeBron is, but she's like she's the polarizing figure in gymna- uh, gymnastics, and they are using her in like commercials. They are using her on ESPN. She went to the ESPYS. She's went to all these award shows, and she's made zero dollars. And she can't. She can't. And wow. she is um, – she's one of the most polarizing just figures that's not a basketball or football player in college right now. If you don't watch college football or basketball, I'm almost positive you would know who Kaylin o- O'Shawnee is. I think that's how you say your name. I don't even remember. But I've seen that today. Is like that is the key factor – that California is saying, like, this doesn't just extend to football and basketball and to recruiting and all this stuff. This extends a long way in that these kids made superstars of themselves and at their peak where they actually get to show off their abilities because yeah. there's no professional level for all these other sports, really, besides the Olympics. It's true. And so then it's like, well, she can't make any money from where she is essentially in the prime of her – competing career so i see your standpoint you're saying that you know espn and game day mm-hmm. and, you know talking about football now um they're using these players names their clips mm-hmm. um their news yeah just like it would be tmz but they're using it so that they can profit off of it well it's like they own the, it's like espn says i'm pretty sure they would have to buy from the ncaa right but it's like the ncaa is like we run our own reality show so, you, therefore, you can use whatever you want from our reality show as long as we say so. Yeah, it's like TMZ. Yeah. And it's like we're Which I don't Big Brother. TMZ, but. It's like you get to have whatever you want from this show as long as you tell us that you're going to take it. So, then, like, what? CBS has SEC, right? Yeah. So, so let's say you're Tim Tebow. For the CBS to have to play your games, you'd have to get a release from Tim Tebow's agent. Yeah, I would say so. So you'd have to pay him. I, I mean, that's the iffy part. Where does this ultimately stop? Can you make – it's like we, we said this last time when our mic, my mic was muted. We went on this for a really long time. But it's like, can you make a YouTube channel and make money yeah. off of a day in the life of me going to school? and Because a kid did it at UCF, and he got kicked off the team, and yeah. he made so little money from the fact that he wasn't – on the football team anymore that he couldn't yeah. even stay in the dorm. He just left USC in general. Now he's real popular because of the fact that he was making a YouTube channel and NCAA did see that as an ad revenue and that ultimately went yeah. pretty far. But And, um, I mean, for some of these kids, they don't even have money to buy meals, which we talked about yeah. last time. Who was it that said he couldn't even go to McDonald's? Oh, I don't um, even remember. But it's true oh, for most of these players. Um, the guy on College Football Live, not – the typical four, but the guy that's on the side, he goes to Georgia. He went to Georgia, and uh, he said that when I was at school, I didn't even have money to buy McDonald's or to buy – he said not even a McDonald's, just a hamburger in general. Yeah. He said I didn't have money to do this stuff. And it's like, well, look at – if you use my analogy again where it's like high school, it's like, well, you're paying for the other two meals almost. But then it's like if you have a class that's not in time with – the scheduling of where they make food and when they don't, yeah. you know, then that causes a problem. And you're living completely away and living by yourself. Because yeah. it's like in high school, you still, at least you live with a parent or a guardian that's making money and yeah. therefore can buy something for you. Yeah. But then it's like you're completely reliant in college. At You're reliant on this school completely to keep you alive. Because yeah. if you don't have a family, because they have to make money – and therefore send it to you in order to do something with it. Yeah. And it's like a lot of people don't have that kind of money. Yeah, most people. I would guarantee yeah. you most kids don't have that. Yeah. And the opportunity that this opens for um, kids to be able to provide for their families that come from broken mm-hmm. homes, this gives them a, a better opportunity to focus on the game. Yeah. You know, if your mom's at home and she's starving and you're like, oh, i got to play football, but I'm, I'm trying to make some yeah. money on the side. You don't have to worry about that now because you can mm-hmm. send her money, you know? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are saying now that this will open the door for kids to be able to play at least one year college football and leave if they want to. 
Yeah. And I don't think I agree with that just because the – I mean, it's a possibility. But if you're making, let's just say, $150,000 mm-hmm. at, at USC, which I think would be a lot more than that. Oh, yeah. Because you're going to have a contract Especially with, if they're the only state. You're going to have contracts with every company possible. Mm-hmm. They're going to be sending you free stuff. Mm-hmm. Hey, and then if you have an Instagram and a YouTube, you know, you're going to get so much free stuff. Yeah. Um, but anyways, um, if you're making that much money, you're getting that much stuff. I think you're going to see more money poured into this than the NFL. As, yeah, as because this total. is definitely the more polarizing of the two. Like this is the NBA of basketball. This is the, yeah. the place where if you want to watch football, you – Almost everybody watches college football and prefers it. At least in the South, that's a definite yeah, fact. Yeah, I hate they prefer, the NFL. They prefer – I prefer college football over anything. I yeah. would rather watch Miami play the way we are and lose than watch the Miami Dolphins, which is a horrible <laughs> example. But, like, <laughs> yeah. what's, like, a middle-of-the-road team? Like, like Cowboys, Browns. Like, like, like the, the Jets or something. Like, yeah. somebody that's in the middle. Yeah. Like the Lions or something. It's like – there's only 32 teams, and they are all t- way too good for it to be exciting unless you're elite like Mahomes, Saquon Barkley, Le'Veon Bell. Like, honestly, the, I've watched the – I would rather watch the college championship game than, than the Super Bowl. I would, too. It's just it's, it's just so much exciting. fun. It's, it seems like it's more, it's more aggressive. Mm-hmm. It's faster. I don't know. The only thing that I think about this is the fair pay to play. Is this going to produce a lot of crybabies? Like Does it turn into the NFL? Yeah, but I don't think so. Yeah. I think you're going to get some that are just there for the check, but mm-hmm. ultimately I think it's a good go. Obviously, Tyler's excited for NCAA, the, the game. Yeah, that is a big thing. I forgot about uh, that completely. So but so we'll yeah, probably so get to see that again. You can make NCAA football again. Let's go. With but names, uh, with actual names and yeah. numbers and players. But It's, it's probably going to uh, be very expensive, but – and so where does it's like where does this end? And I think that's why you would have to have a federal government involved. Well, it's got to be like the NFL. Yeah. You know, you got to have caps. You got to have regulations. Mm-hmm. You know, it's you can't just say because honestly, if that was if there were no caps, I wouldn't be surprised if a five star quarterback makes a million dollars a year in college as a freshman. Somebody like Trevor Lawrence or like a Tua. I could see that. I could see two of them making a million dollars a year. But it's like it's also people need to realize like um, somebody like Clemson doesn't have a lot of booster money. Like they just That's they're true. just a really good team, and they just so happen they're like the way Miami was in the eighties. They had nobody that was good at Miami. Yeah. You know, during that time, that really had booster money until these our former players are our booster money. Right. And it's not like Texas because. The, that's the whole reason I said that Texas and Florida and California need to step in on this is because it's like, oh, I get to pay, I get to be paid playing football, and I live in West Palm, and I only have to drive the 45-minute drive to Miami. My family can come a 45-minute drive on Saturdays to watch me play football, and I get to have potentially make money on my name and my likeness. I get to show up at a car dealership for a little autograph signing, and – I get paid, you know, twenty k. We'll say it's not outrageous, like a hundred k, but I get paid twenty k for one visit. I think that would hold me over for four years. Yeah. It's, if you money manage that right, you could say I would spend this on what I don't necessarily um, need. I could spend this just on necessities, where it's just extra food if I want it, or extra clothes. I can make sure that I live on this. And I have, you know, what you can even extend an olive branch. If I have one of those a year, that's a set for a while. I think it cuts down, too, on the amount of people that leave during their junior year of football. Um, this was made uh, March of this year. Uh, the richest school, obviously, is Harvard. Yeah. $38.3 billion last year, endowment. Guess who's number two? University of Texas system, which I guess would include, like, Longhorns and – Texas A and M, I don't know if that's just the. Well, Longhorns. no, UT has like UT Austin, UT, uh, like a couple other. Okay, so I that's why they say system. It well, may that's, just meet. That's in second, that. thirty point nine billion dollars. Yeah. Then it goes on to Yale, Stanford, Princeton, but Texas is number two with Ivy League schools as far as capital. Yeah, I mean, it's like where does this? 
And then you have the kids like, oh, I live in Dallas. I'm a good recruit. Oh, I could go play at Texas Tech even and make but, money. But imagine, instead of, though, imagine you're the Longhorns, and you're like, okay, who do we want? Mm-hmm. You have unlimited cap. Yeah. And it's like, It's okay. like playing baseball. Baseball's cap is based on how much money you make. Yeah. So, so imagine you have the Longhorns that gets every recruit. Every five stars. That's what I'm saying. Eventually, if you have those three states, it forces the NCAA's hand. It says, look, all the kids of Florida want to stay at Florida. They go to some school in Florida. Yeah. I don't even think this necessarily benefits Miami as much as um, No, and I don't know how that anybody, works because Miami's a private school. But Miami is a, a major, major city in the, well, yeah, in, yeah, in the I United know. States. So I think that um, there could be a lot that would happen with Miami, but I think it benefits more of somebody like Florida but who's got the, a lot of booster money. But too. do the people that are rich in Miami even go to Miami? They usually go to Harvard. Well, that's the thing. Miami Yale, is one of the Princeton. only schools in the entire country where 98% of their fan base didn't even go there. Yeah. They went to community college. Yeah, like you could see it. Like I yeah. didn't even go there. And we're yeah. doing this podcast right now talking about them. But I'm saying most of the rich people in Miami went to Texas. Went to USC. Yeah. So it's like, where's their money going to go? Yeah. It's going to go to their alma mater. It's like there's huge schools that are pillars of college football in all three of those states. But imagine, though, like the Longhorns. You get a stacked team. You spend all this money. Okay. So then you're the Longhorns. You're like, okay, ESPN, we have the best team in the nation. Yeah, our rates just went up. You want to put yeah. us on TV? It's like now you got to pay. Well, Texas has their own network. Well, no, I know the Longhorns do. But in like ESPN, you want to show yeah. our clips? YouTube, you want to do this? Mm-hmm. You're gonna have to pay. But it's like it becomes the a wild, wild west of what you see with like the likes of Michael Jordan in the '80s, where it's just like, what can you possibly do outside of basketball that really makes a name for yourself? Yeah. And I think there's a lot of yeah. kids that'll. It's gonna be very much so in its infancy, where it's like. It could be outrageous, and then I think you see it come down back to reality where they realize these kids are never guarantees. Shea Patterson is at Michigan right now. He was the number 50 overall right now since uh, recruit ever since 2000, or Mm -hmm. 1999, is when they started tracking and ranking these kids on a 1 to 300 scale. Yeah, He is 50 overall since 1999, and he is terrible. Like, he's not, he probably won't even start in Michigan. He should, he should be on the bench, but their backup quarterback, who is Christian McCaffrey's brother, oh. um, Dylan McCaffrey, he got a concussion. He came in for three plays and got a concussion. And so, therefore, Shea Patterson had to trot himself back out. Uh, he went eight for, like, 40-something. Oh. Like, he went terrible in Wisconsin. And Michigan fans hate him. And, like, it's like, well, that kid going to Michigan. Well, he was at Ole Miss. Ole Miss got in trouble when he transferred to Michigan. And it's like, Michigan's got a lot of money. And yeah. it's like, well, this kid is terrible. He's not going to probably even make an NFL roster. Yeah. And you just have to realize that you would see that a lot of these kids aren't guarantees, and that includes Miami because um, we've had a lot of terrible recruits come through here. Through so this years, is for but. all NCAA sports, right? What do you mean? Like, uh, yeah, in California. Okay. I don't know if this is like an opt-in kind of thing or what, but – um, we talked about this for a while, but I really wanted this to um, to be a it's thing. It's like all divisions. Because, yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Wow. And so, you know, it's like where does this end? Where does this, where does this begin? I guess we'll hmm. figure out in five years if whether or not this is a federal I mean, if nothing else, if the players don't get rich, if they don't make crazy money, if you just have some of the kids making a simple paycheck every month, I'm okay with that. Yeah, you know, I I really don't care about them getting rich. I mean, if they want to, yeah, that's there cool, will be the outliers that get a ton of money. Oh yeah, and make there it. always is. Yeah, but if everybody has a chance, you know, you get a scholarship, you have a chance to get a contract, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe the schools can incorporate. Like, say, let's say Miami, you know, includes is included in this, and then who does Miami's with Adidas, right? Yeah. So, so let's say Adidas comes to Miami and says, okay, we want to give every kid shoes. They already do. I mean, like, personal. Okay. Like, sign a contract with the team and say, when the kids sign up for Miami, they're all going to get personal shoes, and we're going to pay them all $500 a month. Mm-hmm. You know, like, automatic contract. Yeah. 
They get Adidas shoes for free. No, I know. Yeah. Their their shoes are sick. Yeah. Don't tell me like personal. Yeah, yeah. Let's Makes okay. Sense. Every every player on the team is gonna get Yeezys, and for every semester, mm-hmm. and then they're gonna get a five hundred dollar paycheck. Yeah. So that that would be interesting too. So if if the school could make contracts with their suppliers mm-hmm. to get the kids some money, it's a win win. Yeah. It's uh, it's very much. Uh, very much so in its infancy. We don't really know what the ultimate outcomes of this will be, but I just really hope it gets hammered in. The only thing I will say is poor Johnny Menzel. Oh, yeah. He was if he, if he would have just – He was ahead of his time. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to kick it off with, I guess, the Miami-Virginia game. Um, it is currently Wednesday as we record this um, at, like, 1. So, at 11 a.m., they announced that uh, Nikosi Perry will be the starter – uh, for Friday night. Thank God. Due to the fact that Jaron is still not 100%. They say he didn't practice Tuesday. Um, there was even a clip that I reacted to that uh, um, that Tate was working out at quarterback. But he still had the white jersey on, um, which was just means regular old contact. But he was having to throw. Um, so I was feeling that maybe Perry was going to start, considering um, you move Tate from receiver just to throw – balls and looked like, you know, they needed a backup quarterback and Tate would obviously be your, you know, if Perry were to get hurt, Tate would probably have to be your third choice um, as there is only like one other scholarship quarterback on roster right now. Uh, so, but we'll, we'll dive more into that. I just want to get that out, out of the way. So a little about Virginia's offense. We'll start off with that. Um, I'm not too hot on their offense. They run a weird, like, triple option spread. Like, Auburn, I don't like it. Like, I like Auburn. Your setup. Yeah, Bryce Perkins, his brother is a, used to be a running back. I don't know if he still is. Was a running back for the Giants. Um, he was from UCLA. And uh, uh, Bryce Perkins is the quarterback at Virginia. Um, he is very much a run first quarterback. He yeah. has no accuracy whatsoever. Um, mm, he's okay. He's not very good. He, uh, against Notre Dame, he 30 out of 43 with 330 Well, that's what, that's what I was saying. They run this, like, triple option where he, like, he fakes it to the running back and he runs out and throws a screen or he keeps it. Yeah. Um, a but lot he's of dual what, threat. He's not as good as Hooker. Uh, no. No, I'm saying. He's not yeah. as good as Hooker, so we don't have to worry about that as much. He's definitely fast. He could definitely run, but yeah. he doesn't run that well. He's only averaged like 33 yards a game. Um, he throws for 235 yards a game. Um, he has eight touchdowns he has on the quite season. A few interceptions, right? How many interceptions does he have? He has six interceptions on yeah. the season. So he has five touchdowns, or not? He has in five games. He has eight touchdowns and six interceptions. So I mean, doesn't really look good. They can't really run the ball well. They only run the ball 107 yards a game. Um, wherever Miami is, it can't be much worse or much better or anything. But uh, they it offense is not complicated in the sense that um, it's like intricate and you don't really know what they're doing like it was against Virginia Tech. Yeah, especially with the new quarterback. But this is very much a triple op. You treat this like you treat Georgia Tech old school, like of last year. Like just play your assignments and trust your players. Because I think that is the ultimate problem with Miami's defense, but um, we'll get there. But they're going to um, throw their receivers outside, throw their running back on the flats, get their blockers up there, um, use a lot of underneath screen passes. And um, uh, they're just really going to try to counter you with the fact that they don't have a run game. They're going to throw the ball out and use that as an extension of the run. Yeah. And it's going to be pass yards, but it's going to be a run play. It's just. I'm going to say Perkins to Reed, uh, Joe Reed. Is going to be pretty popular this game, yeah. uh, and I cannot say his name ever. I thought it was Dubois, but it's Dubois, oh. their wide receiver. Yeah, Dubois or something. I don't know, but he, he's decent. He did okay against Notre Dame. Um, which well, did you watch also, that game? I watched a little bit of it, and then I, I had to leave. It. So it is also worth noting that they've had a lot of struggles throughout the season on offense. They have a lot of slow starts. Yeah, their O line. They have a lot of points where Bryce Perkins cannot hit the broadside of a barn 
and then he just clicks it. And like they started, they played Old Dominion, who gave Virginia Tech a big run for their money yeah. and nearly beat them again, like they did last season. But they uh, they went down seventeen to nothing, and Virginia scored a uh, a touchdown. Bryce Perkins ran it in, and then they uh, they got like a strip sack fumble for a touchdown, or it was a pick six, I think, for a touchdown. And just Old Dominion was just then shooting themselves in the foot by fumbling yeah. and giving the ball back to Virginia in, in places where they could win. But they uh, they played Pitt week one and, and uh, beat, Pritt, uh, beat Pitt kind of bad and threw yeah. the score. But I think that's week one. You can cross that off because Pitt has showed they're a really good team. They have beat UCF. They're just, Pitt is very inconsistent, and I think Virginia is very inconsistent I also. Oh, yeah. But they – were down big against Florida State, and they came back and beat Florida State. Uh, they were down big at Donald Dominion, came back and beat them. Um, they were down big to Notre Dame, and they just never did really come back. Yeah, It was tied at halftime, I think. And then Notre Dame just busted it open and, you know, really showed them what they could do. But it's also worth noting, too, that they have a bye week last week. Yep. When we were playing Virginia Tech again, our butts spanked, they had a bye week. And – and you're like, well, Perry's starting, but it's like they got to see exactly what Perry's good at. Which, to the which they, saw, they saw Perry last year, too. True, but it wasn't in this style of offense yeah, that he was that's running. That's true, that's true. But you see exactly what Perry's good at and exactly what they're going to do yeah. to an aggressive defense, which they have as we transition to their defense. Um, their defensive scheme, is it anything special like Virginia Tech's, whereas, you know, Virginia Tech was very fast and aggressive. They're going to blitz at you almost every time. They play man up, and then uh, Virginia just doesn't really have a calling card. They're just an average run-of-the-mill defense, but they are insanely good. Um, they are second in the nation in sacks per game with four 4.8 sacks a game, so essentially five sacks a game. Their linebackers have 17 sacks this season alone, which is like three and a half sacks per game or something crazy. Um, and, you know, they are second in the nation in sacks. We are first in the nation in the amount of sacks we have given up, period. I have so. I was just trying to find something. It doesn't really. There's not really much else to say. I mean, scheme is just average, but the numbers are not. Their numbers are incredible. They are in a really good defense. They are a you know, a good covering defense for the moment. And I don't even know if they are aggressive. They don't seem all that aggressive. No. Um, they obviously ha- have to be somewhat aggressive with 17 sacks with, by the linebackers alone. But, I mean, it, and when I watched them, it wasn't like I was watching Bud Foster on defense. You watch Bud Foster, you know exactly what play's coming. Nearly every time, you just can't defend it. Um, So, it just – they are really good at sacks. We are good at giving up, at giving up sacks. So, which Notre Dame sacked them pretty good. Yeah, Notre Dame doesn't uh, have a stellar defensive line either. Which Notre Dame didn't really, didn't really. I think they only ran for like a hundred and fifty something yards on Virginia. And Notre Dame doesn't have a very good just team. But the runs that though. they did looked mm-hmm. pretty good against Virginia's defense. Yeah. So uh, I'm thinking DJ Dallas has a real good chance. I still can't block, man. Well. We'll just transition to Miami's offense. But uh, I have, what's his name, Mendenhall. Mendenhall said this. He said, Miami's dynamic. We know their personnel. And I've been in the league long enough now. And some of the players are players we've had exposure to before. And he says, and man, so the skill players are fast, which means on any given play, a ball could be handed off to someone that goes the whole way. The ball could be thrown to someone that can go the whole way. There's always an inherent threat that's just in the background of your preparation. If you miss a tackle, this could be one that goes for a touchdown. Or if the player gets behind you, that could go for a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said, so in addition to what I've already described as the concepts and the schemes, when you add the personnel into it, there's a dynamic capability that regardless of consistency, some of the teams that are hardest, uh, and when I was calling plays defensively that I was most worried about were the ones that had dynamic personnel that just on any given play could go the whole way. So uh, Mendenhall definitely sees the speed. Mm-hmm. Um he did talk about um, being concerned about the, the differences and whether Jaron was going to start or Kosey was going to start. Um, but he said he was overall comfortable with it because, um, like you said, they had the bye week to prepare for it. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, so they they also get a really good look at a game. A, it's I don't think people realize how instrumental bye weeks are because that is a bye week where you don't have to really Miami, focus. Yeah, for like a normal team that actually is capable of anything, they see that they're. It's like we have nothing to fix from this week's footage because we didn't play anybody. Yeah. So therefore, all we have to do is just focus on this next opponent and. Yeah. It's like, what did they do well in that second half? Because we played lights out second half for the most part. And then, you know, the same kid is starting now. But, you know, at, I had a bunch written down on what I, you know, wanted this little quarterback. Now, it wasn't even a controversy because it was like it was Jaron the whole way. But it was like, as when you see it Tuesday, you're like, is Jaron even going to play? I didn't think he was going to play, which he yeah, isn't. I, I didn't figure he was um, play. So I have a lot written down, but. When I oh. saw the video with Tate in practice, I was like, for sure, Jaron's not going to play. Yeah. And I think they're trying to find any way to not play Kosey, but that mm-hmm. doesn't make sense to me. But Yeah, so Jaron was supposed to be the starter. Um, he's apparently still hurt. Miami always labels it with either a head injury, upper extremity, or lower extremity. They don't give any details. Um, Miami's always been like that. So it's just an upper extremity, but it's very clearly his arm. Yeah. Um, you can see them, like, massaging it and stuff. I think and his shoulder. It. Yeah, he or yeah, that's what I mean. His shoulder, because he um, um, he hurt it in the Central Michigan yeah, game. Yeah, Central Michigan. Yeah, and um, they said it was always just really, uh, really bad. It hurt a lot. So. I think I saw State of the U tweeted that that there was a one hit in Central Michigan where he was definitely holding his shoulder. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, you definitely see his arm kind of like dangling. Was it his throwing arm or? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that might be why he has that power. Yeah, yeah. Um, that makes sense. But you could see though if you watch those plays again. The first interception was like, if you slow it down, uh, uh, Jaron should have hit him a little earlier on the little inside slant, but he hesitates for a second because I think the defensive lineman was in the way, the defensive end, so he had to wait for uh, Harley to kind of clear out of that a little bit. And Harley kind of gets – not kind of, he gets hit early by the defensive back, but it's not enough in real time to re-throw that flag. Right. It, Harley's trying to catch it with his chest, and the kid bumps into him, and, you know, Harley's arms go down, and it hits him right in the actual chest, flies up, and that's a pick. That's un- just unfortunate. The second one is uh, – defensive, or the offensive line breaks down completely. Yeah. Jaren's running out, and as he steps – you're not rolling out, but he, as he goes to step into it, he doesn't step fully or far enough forward, which is what you're – QB mechanics are you're supposed to shift your weight, step forward far to get more power. Yep. All, the defensive lineman is coming and hits him in the leg as he's throwing it. And so kind of it's around the same time. But he sees that guy coming and therefore doesn't step far enough forward. So he doesn't get enough power. The third one was a defensive line, just gets through the offensive line like it's butter. Yeah. And he just makes a terrible decision, has to throw off platform as he's getting nearly hit and – it just it just dilutes into ultimately that it was not even his fault at all, really. Even though that I was bashing him saying it was his fault. And a lot of people were. But um It's Dan Enos. And it's Enos apparently. What? Enos, yeah. Enos? Yeah. No, I'm not calling him that. And <laughs> That's stupid. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna give you some stats that were just going to run through, not stats, but, like, I guess they will be. But Miami is on pace this season to give up 60 sacks on the season. That is a lot. We fired Art Kehoe. If you're a Miami fan, you know who Art Kehoe is. He was our offensive line for, like, ever. Like, if I'm not mistaken, he was there from, like, the 90s through the 2000s. He gave up 36 sacks in his season, and they fired him. We're on pace to score or to have 60 sacks on our quarterbacks this season. I don't know if that stays the same with Kosey coming in. Yeah, because it's definitely going to be more shotgun and air raid. But but he rolls out. Yeah. The Joker runs. I guess we'll just talk about that, but we'll start there. Uh, if with it being Perry, I would just assume that this is the offense that we're going to run will be the one that we ran in the second half against Virginia Tech. In a very much an air raid, spread out scheme with a little under center trinkled in there. Because the under center in that 
uh, second half looked like it was timed perfectly. Like we were going shotgun, then we were going under center, and the plays just worked beautifully. And then, you know, they flip it on its head after the game and say, oh, we're going with Jaron, and we're going to be under center like a bunch of stupid people. When the NFL right now only uh, – in the NFL right now, somebody did a count, 63% of the time – NFL teams are in the shotgun, and there are a couple teams that are. Percentage we're under under center. Well, that would be the opposite. Minus one hundred. No, you said NFL. Yeah, what we're is un- the Hurricanes oh, under center. Under center, I would say we were anywhere between seventy five to ninety percent under yeah. center. I mean, he didn't really count that one, but there are teams that are under center majority, like the Eagles, the Steelers, um, the Patriots are literally fifty fifty. Or it's 49, 51, 51 being the shotgun. But, like, teams like Cleveland are, like, in the 75 range. Teams like the Chiefs are 85%. Teams like the Jets were, like, 70%. And they even have Trevor Simeon. But and so it just Pope shows injured? you. Hmm? Is Mark Pope injured? He was. He wasn't. He's not anymore. So, Miami's on pace to give up 60 sacks this season. Miami joins only a few teams that are over the 50% blue chip ratio. So, that means is recruits are a blue chip prospect if they are a four-star and above. My, er, Miami is now joining by, like, with Clemson, Alabama, and Ohio State. I don't think there are many where over half of their team are four stars or better. And this is the way we're playing. We're also number 18 overall at the beginning of the season in terms of talent on roster. So they said that due to just the sheer talent of our roster, we are 18th in the entire country based on that. We are the 18th best team. And here we are now at 2-3. and three. But we are also seven plays probably from being 5-0. and oh. Do you agree? Miss a couple field goals at Florida. You miss a couple field goals at oh, UNC. You mean like seven plays total? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, if not less. Yeah. I say like, one play per game, so, mm-hmm. yeah. Everybody's like, oh, we still gave up a touchdown at Virginia Tech, but it's like if he makes that extra point, I don't think they got that momentum Yeah, to really go down and score. But either way. It's, Even if they do, though, we still have that time to drive the ball. Yeah. We have that one second – you know, one second last play, but that's, I think that's the hardest part is because. But it still would have done nothing because it would just would have masked the fact that we were terrible. Well, no, I know, but that's what I was saying. I think it's the hard thing is, is yeah, Miami could have won all these games, but when you're predicted to, to blow Virginia Tech out of the water and you don't even show up, it doesn't even matter if you win anymore. Mm-hmm. Like even winning, you still lost. Central yeah. Michigan. Yeah. Cause you we're won, favored. We're you f- lost. We're favored in this game. A little bit, right? Like two and a half. I think it's what it is today. Because yesterday, so, yesterday, the odds were for Virginia. Yeah, so basically, I have a whole spiel. I'm like, it was Jaron versus Kosey as to what was going on in practice. But I said, I would venture to say it's Perry at this point. So we better go air raid and sling it out. Jaron and Perry can't, do, can't outdo the other in their scheme. Jaron cannot step into Perry's offense and play the offense better than Perry can. Perry cannot step into Jaron's offense and play Jaron's offense better than yeah, Jaron can. Yeah, I mean, they're two completely different quarterbacks. And it's like, it, so that that point being, if we step out with Perry and play Jaron's scheme, it's we're going to get whopped. But I think, though, that Kosey's smart enough that if he's in trouble, he's going to run out. That doesn't even matter, though, when you're under center all the time. Yeah, but Jaron holds on to the ball a lot longer. Kosey mm-hmm. likes to get rid of it. Uh, if Kosey's in trouble, he gets away. Jaron's kind of like. I see your point, but I just don't think it matters. When their linebackers have 17 sacks, that's showing me that oh, aren't only yeah. are they getting through the line, they are tracking you down once you try to move. Yeah. So that means it doesn't matter. So I would also like to say that I don't think this QB change permanently is necessarily a good thing. I think it's very bad the fact that we've played Jaron for four and a half weeks, essentially, and then we're saying, you know what? We were wrong. I don't think you're going to cut it. 
and it really reflects bad on Enos and his offensive scheme. That's really going to take us getting used to. But well, you know what though, I when I was watching in Enos, when I was watching his press conference from the post game Virginia, mm-hmm. he was talking, and this could just be me, but it seemed like he likes Perry, but Manny likes Jaron. Because at the end of the the conference, Eno said, "Well, at the end of the day, it's it's Manny's decision." Yeah, it's also the fact that I know that they're all really good talkers. Yeah, everybody that is a Miami fan now knows this, but they're you, all just not buying anything anybody is saying. But if you watch Manny's press conference, it's always, "Yeah, we're starting Jaron. We're starting Jaron. We're starting Jaron. We're starting Jaron." That could be true. I think Manny likes Jaron. But Enos likes Perry. It's Enos. Whatever. Enos. <laughs> we both are. Enos from Dukes of Hazard. It's uh That's before your time. I do remember him. Okay. It is the it is something to say that you are changing your scheme. If they even do this. This yeah. so that would also taught. mean that you what you have said is halfway true in the sense that he likes the way uh, Perry plays in his scheme. So yeah. that would mean, A, we're having to change our scheme completely for Perry. Are we going to do that? I don't know. You don't think so? I don't I don't know. I think that's the point. It's I like, think they have to. This is how much it has changed in two days. In two days, me and you both were all out on Enos saying we don't want him. Yeah. And then now it's yeah. like, then you get another little fact that it's like, oh, you know what? It may not even been his decision. And it's like, at the end of the day, what we say doesn't really matter because we don't – Yeah, we don't know. We're not in that program. We don't know. And so it's just – it's typical Miami fan facts where we're just spewing facts without knowing anything. Yeah. Because it's like – But we try to take really? the details what we have and we try to build off of it. You know, we try to – because you have to take the hints mm-hmm. with these guys, like you said. As political as Manny Diaz is, he's grown up in politics, you yeah. know – you live in a political household, you learn how to become political. You learn how to try and please everybody, and you try to be everybody's friend. But well, that's what everybody said at the beginning. We were definitely fed a horse crap of lies from the beginning. I don't know, though. Week zero, Miami looked good. And I think that's the problem. We have done nothing but regress since week one. I don't and know it's if, like, like the Florida, Florida wasn't even that big of a game, in my mind. It was like, oh, we lost. That's just bragging rights. It doesn't really mentally, matter. Mentally, it was a big game. But it's still, you could have went undefeated and played Clemson, and you probably still would have been the top ten. I mean, team look in the at country. Florida now. Florida's now undefeated. If we played Florida right now, we would get whopped like by fifty points. Yeah, yeah. Even with Philly sure. Bay Franks at the helm, for sure. With Franks at the helm, I still think we would lose like fifty oh, to nothing. I don't nothing. know about that, but I think with Emory Jones in the pocket, you guys definitely it's still. Lose 50. It still doesn't matter because. And I always say this, week zero, you guys played incredible, which Florida Florida always has their little niche, you know, mess-ups. Florida didn't play as good as they're playing now, but Miami hasn't played as good either. But it's also worth noting that Bud Foster basically just came out and said that nobody is scared of Jaron when they see them on film. Yeah. When they see – you sent me that, but I've seen it a couple times before you send it to me. Yeah. But he basically said, nobody is scared of Jaron Williams when we yeah. see him in the pocket. They yeah. know he's not going to throw it deep. They know he doesn't throw it past 15 yards. But who's to blame for that? That's what we're trying to figure out. And I think that's the old, just the revolving door that it's like, is this Manny? Is this Eno? Is this Enos? Is this Jaron? Is this Perry? Is you know, is this Jaron's awareness? Is it Jaron's arm yeah. strength? It's uh, so many factors yeah. that go into the, what we're doing on offense. And is it Enos? I think half of it, just because he ran this way, he's had this offensive scheme for a long time. He's ran this offensive scheme for a while. Um, he did it at Arkansas. He did it at Central Michigan. And it's like, well, those aren't good schools. Yeah. But still, look at what Central Michigan had. They had a, a mobile quarterback that was fast. He could launch it a mile, but he wasn't very accurate. Yeah. But they had a very much a – so a very modern scheme at Central Michigan. They had fast players – that just ultimately didn't have the the skill to beat us. Yeah, and I will say that about Perry is Perry's aggressiveness aggressiveness mm-hmm. tends to make him inaccurate. Yep, and that kind of concerns me going against Virginia. Yeah, it's 
also worth noting that while Virginia does get a bye week, Miami has always historically, if they lose to one of the Virginia teams, the other Virginia team they play next yeah. gets whopped yeah. by a ton. And it does that happen? I don't know. Yeah, in which they lost last year, right? They whopped Virginia Tech, and they yeah. lost to Virginia. Yeah, at home. Right. They, yeah, they were at Virginia, and yeah. they lost. Yeah. And so then, you know, it's like, well, here we are now. We are in week six. Well, seven, technically, but we have a, a bye week. We are in week six of our schedule, and we have played two teams who we have beat by a total of 60-plus points last season with Mark Rick's offense. 60-plus points, we have beaten two teams, and we have lost to both of them by narrow margins. We barely lose to North Carolina. We barely lose to Virginia Tech, but it all starts the exact same. We yeah. always start slow, and yep. we have to build our way back. Yeah, that's the scary thing too. Is it's like, what if Miami never came back in the second half? Mm-hmm. And it's like Virginia Tech's going to be like fifty and zero. Yeah, it was not going to be good, man. I just, I think I think at this point we're squeezing the lemon dry with offense because it's like we just ultimately don't know. Yeah, and so I, I say they'll put Perry in. If he's throwing that many yards, Virginia Tech, he's going to do pretty good. At least he's going to drive the ball, if nothing else. Well, that's the thing. It's like, who does this look bad on if this becomes a permanent thing? If this becomes a permanent thing with Perry at quarterback? That would require us to know the actual yeah, truth the thing. of who's making the decision. If you had told Jared. me this, asked me this question 20 minutes ago, I said that was Enos 100%. I think it's Manny, though. Because but is it Manny? Is that true? You know, like I think Manny. Just are you just know. reading into it too much? Like, Maybe what is I could this? be. I could I mean, be. That, that's ultimately what this comes down to. So it's my personal opinion that we'll just say we'll just go from here. I think Perry's scheme is way better than Jaron's. Yes, and Perry's what Miami needs for now. Mm-hmm. Jaron looks good in the future. Yeah, for sure. Jaron yeah. just needs more time. I think. Yeah, we'll go from there. Um, as for the defense, ooh, ooh, this could ooh. go either way. Um, Virginia's got a very easy scheme to figure out. They're not consistent. He can't throw the ball well. And so you have to – and he can't really run the ball exceptionally well. He's not very fast. He is a good runner, but he's no like yeah. – so what this offense is compared to is Nick Marshall when Auburn went to the championship game versus FSU. Their offense is not good. But Nick Marshall in that Auburn offense, all their players that they had ran like four fours. Nick Marshall was a corner that they converted to quarterback. And so if you can imagine how fast he would be at quarterback. So what Good they would Lord. do, they would run a screen with a the receiver. They would fake it, triple option. So they, you know, they're reading a zone read with the running back and the quarterback. And so the quarterback has to pull it. He then has the choice to either throw it out or run it. So then it becomes a screen pass slash quarterback run or slash running back run. So it is very much the modern wing T offense that Georgia Tech has. Wow. It could be very easy to defend if you play it right. It's all very much assignment based. If I can't get to that guy and there's a receiver in front of me, I don't try to get off that receiver. I hold him and let guys get past me and make that tackle. Mm-hmm. It is very much a selfless style of defense that I think we need right now to play because it seems – I mean, Manny is saying this, so it's like take it with a grain of salt because he's just the smooth talker that he is. But he's been saying that our defense doesn't trust each other. They don't trust everybody else to stay in their responsibilities and stay where they are they are supposed to be and do what they are supposed to do. I could see that. But also, he says that we're calling the same plays this year that we were calling last year. And if that's the case, why is Michael Pinckney at defensive tackle? He well, is five eleven. Well, let's talk about that first point you have right there. Manny's okay. Yeah, we'll Let, skipped over talk all about that because I really want to talk about that. Manny says he's taking a bigger role with the defense. We said this uh, post Monday game. post game. He said that. Yeah. Uh, no, he said this Monday in his interview Monday morning. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, we talked about this on Monday a little bit, but it was like. It's still the same thing as what we said Monday. I just don't believe it at all. Yeah. Well, you had Baker come on right after and say, basically, yeah. I'm still calling I'm plays. I'm still calling plays, but I'm glad that Manny's here. But Manny said in his post game press conference that he was 
um, gonna take not post game, but his uh, actual weekly press conference. Yeah, he said that he was taking over on the defense because they needed to trust one another, and he was holding them gonna hold them more accountable. I don't believe a yeah. word of that. I, I think either. Baker, especially as close as they were holding the fact that Jaron was injured to the chest, I think they're gonna put Baker in the box, and Manny's gonna call plays. I doubt it. That would be the ultimate reality where that I see be, this as getting completely turned around. That would be interesting. If if we came out Virginia, Baker's in the box, Manny's calling D, D plays, Enos is doing his thing. Enos. With, whatever. Uh, I'm going to call him Enos. Uh, Enos oh, is doing his thing with Perry's scheme. Yeah. I think we see Miami. But we've said that every week, and we've been wrong. So I'm just going to go ahead and say that Miami's not going to show up and that Miami's going to lose terribly. I don't think they will at this point. I think they've definitely – they're playing for pride, and at this point, how much do you value it? They don't have any pride. I mean, why would then Why then fight back from 28 nothing? Depends on what Manny told them. Because it's uh, – everybody said, well, fire Manny, all that stuff. But how you play in that second half is a direct reflection of your head coach. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. There's no telling what Manny told him in the locker room. Because if you are 28 to nothing, you quit if your coach is not on you all the time about not quitting. Yeah. So you have somebody like Manny who has implemented the culture that we are not out of this game and we should have won this game. Yeah. We almost beat a team where we were down 28 to nothing and we almost came back and beat them. If the defense would have just helped us out a tiny bit more, we'd have beat these clowns. And we wouldn't have as bad of a conversation as we're having. And that's the point. If So, all in essence, on defense, we're, we got to stop lining Michael Pickney up at defensive attack. Have you seen the play where they, he is being passed off by three linemen? He no. is at defensive tackle, and they run a outside stretch play. He comes through, the center hits him and throws him. So they're running to the left. So the, the left guard then has him. And a pick kind of outruns him, so he throws him off, and the left tackle just blows him up. Pick goes flying back like 10 yards and falls down. And it's like, why is he at defensive tackle? Michael Pickney right now has the amount of tackles he had last season is nearly the same. He is average for what he usually does. But his assists are nearly like 10% of what he usually has in assists. Shaq is just nowhere to be seen. Yeah. And at this point, it's like, what's the problem? I mean, nobody really knows. So, I guess we'll just have to wait and see on that one. So, nobody really knows. Um, so, I mean, I have a lot of stuff that was predicated on the fact that Jaron was going to play. So, all that essentially has to be thrown out the window. But, um Mark Rick's offense was better, I think, than what Enos had for Jaron. And if that's the case where he's been told to run that offense, then that really is awful. But, I mean, it's all – at the end of the day, I think Miami needs a massive overhaul for their coaching staff, other than Manny Diaz. Honestly, I don't know if that would even help. I don't think there's a 0% chance that – we fire Dan Eno, uh, Dan Enos through before the end of the season. Um, it's like I mean everything that I have predicates on the fact that this is all Enos' fault. Then if it's like well if it's not then that sounds really ignorant. Yeah. And it remains to. I think we have to we have to look at it from all sides all angles. Um. Yeah, there's a possibility that Enos is responsible for, you know, Jaron and the play calling, and. You know, then we go to defense. It's like, who's responsible? You know, at any time, Manny's there. He could take the reins, you know. Sure. And it's like, is it the players? Are we wrong? Is it the players? I think our offensive line is definitely the problem with the well, players. Yeah, we know that. We, we, we can all agree that the talent on the O-line is just not there. The heart's not there. Yeah. Um, But it's like. You know, Miami's defense, first half against Virginia Tech, it's like, did they come up with heart? Yeah, I mean, 
we we played terrible against Virginia Tech in the first half. And the reason why I'm not talking as much is because I think the game is going to speak for itself. Yeah. And I don't want to say anything until after I see this game. Mm-hmm. Let's take a look at what Perry does. You know, let's we see. See, if, we if say Manning, this every week. This is a very much an instrumental game, as because as was Virginia Tech, because Virginia Tech has shown that our offense cannot operate the way it was. Right. We therefore have to change it. Yeah. A well, little we saw bit. That and it's like halfway well, through the first. Perry is the change, even though it's not necessarily like Perry over Jaron. It's Jaron's hurt. We're gonna play Perry. And yeah, I don't think Perry's the best replacement. Yeah, I don't for think he's sure. the answer. I agree. Perry's not the answer. You know, but then again, what is the answer? You know, Tate was in practice. Tate's obviously not the answer because I don't think he is. Yeah. Um, we'll have more to say after this game. We, I think we both want to see what Miami's going to do yeah. if they make There's the changes. Too many ifs. Yeah, if they make the changes that they talk about, you know, if my if Manny starts making play calls a little bit more for defense, um, if Perry shows up, if the defense shows up, um. You know, is Perkins going to run all over Miami? I don't think so. Are they going to pass all over Miami? I don't think so. But <laughs> because you could look at last week's podcast and call me a complete liar. So, I mean, it's like, well, this offense that oh, Virginia has not dominated anybody throughout the season. So, yeah. what perfect time for them to dominate somebody yeah. when we say they won't. But And, you know, Virginia's got a tough schedule. Well, yeah, they're on our side, but they have – they got to, they had to play Notre Dame. We didn't have to play them. They got to play Duke next next week. Then the, their last game, I think, is UNC. Um, I don't know. Yeah, we got a uh, we got a tough sc- schedule ahead, and this is a lot of if, ifs, ands, or buts. Like it's like, do we change the scheme? Is the scheme change a result of Jaron being worse than Perry? Is Perry better? Do we keep Perry throughout the entire time now? Is it Enos' problem that the offense is the way it was? Was it Manny's? There's so many factors that the was could happen. I think we just got to watch Friday and just wait and see what they say. Because if yeah. Perry plays the way he did against Virginia Tech in that second half, I think it's a pretty big discussion as to who gets this quarterback job. Yeah. And also falls bad on all these coaches saying that Jaron was our guy. Jaron's the guy that's going to lead us to – to wins, and it's like, well, I don't even know if it's necessarily Jaron's fault, but he hasn't. We've now lost two games essentially because of him. He played terrible in that Florida game, and he's played terrible in Virginia Tech. So, Oh, I will say, which I didn't bring this up, I want to bring this up again. I really want to see what Jeff Thomas is going to do. Jeff Thomas yeah. looked really good against Virginia Tech with Perry. So I think you'll definitely see them kind of doubling him up, but does that even really matter? Well, then you got KJ, then you got Brevin. You know? I think that's the thing. If Kosey has time in the pocket and not everybody has to block for him, then you got You DJ. still got Harley. And it's like you got KJ, Harley, Brevin, and Mallory in Dallas. It's like yeah. if you double up Jeff, there's still so much more speed you got to account for. Yeah. Our, I guarantee you Brevin is faster than most of their linebackers. Yeah. And well, it's like, do we play our offense the same way? I want to see shots to, to Brevin more, and I want to see DJ get the ball more. Oh, for sure. I don't like the fact that – uh, Cam plays as much. I don't really like him yeah. as uh, as much as I used to. Um, just because Dallas is just such he's a, a beast. He's such an X factor. He's like Jeff. You give the ball to him, you don't know what he's going to do. Yeah. And that is good or bad. As in, he could go backwards and try to make too much, but he doesn't really do that. He is all X factor good. He yeah. could break this for a touchdown. He breaks more tackles. Cam doesn't break tackles. Cam lacks a little bit of the vision. And then you have Dallas, who just, bro, just give him the ball. Yeah, like Cam, if there's a hole, he's going to take it. And if he has room, he'll run. Mm-hmm. But if somebody's in his way, he's getting stopped. But For sure. DJ break the whole team. and Yeah. it's. I mean, I'm not – I'm going to be honest. I'm not very excited for this game. I uh, kind of am now, yeah. I mean, if, if Miami shows up, it's going to be exciting. What do you think? Do you have projection? For it's score? Also, it's, it all stems on the fact of what we do for our scheme. If yeah. we go the same way we have been with Jaron, I don't see us winning at all. But if we yeah. come out in our unique offense for Perry, I can see us putting up a lot of points. Yeah, because he, he threw, what, 430? Yeah. 
Yeah. But he also played terrible last year against Virginia Tech. Yeah, which he said he said he wants to. Yeah. He wants to fix that because that was the game that he was not playing great. He threw an interception, yeah. but the receiver ran the wrong route. That was the sloppy Perry that we know. It wasn't even that bad, honestly. So no. what the main thing is, um, it looked like Rick was giving him a short leash, like. If you screw up one time, it's Rozier. Oh. And he threw, like, a pick. The receiver uh, was an option route, and he cur- uh, curled in, and Perry kind of threw it over top as a go route. And uh, it was a wrong read by the receiver, and it just ran right into the – the guy just ran right underneath it, the defender mm-hmm. did. And um, Mark Rick just kind of pulled the plug. And a lot of Miami fans were mad at that game. Um, but I don't really want this to be the QB turns that we saw, saw last season. But, I mean – does that help us win games? And is that effective yeah. to the future even? Yeah. It's like, I don't, the season is a wash almost. Does this help us throughout the ne- the coming years having Perry at quarterback? Yeah. And honestly, if you see Tate come out for QB, I think, I think that lets you know that we're in trouble. True. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give the game to Virginia just because in Miami fashion, they haven't showed up. I'm going to say Virginia wins by seven, low scoring game. Man, this could go either way. I say like thirteen, seventeen, something like that. Seven, seven, fourteen. I don't know. If this they come out in the same scheme, I don't think Miami scores a touchdown. I'm not gonna bet on them. I'm gonna give Miami three, not even three. Man, maybe I'll give them seven. I think they'll hit a, a, a touchdown. <laughs> they will not hit a field goal. Watch us. Oh, <laughs> I don't even want to talk about Bubba. We will I not sent, I sent Tyler a field video goal. of Bubba in eighth grade making a 50-yard field goal, and it's like, okay. So I got no response on that. If our video, offense comes way. out in the way that Perry is supposed to play, we could score like 40. Yeah. I mean. We scored 35. But I'm not getting my hopes up. True. I mean, that's, that's fair. In my, in my heart, I feel like they're going to come out and Perry's going to be the bomb, and it's going to be sick, and Miami's going to blow him out. But in true Miami fashion, mm-hmm. I'm going to say Virginia takes it. I mean, at this point, it's, there's too much in yeah, the air. Yeah, there's too many ifs, um, which we've said almost every game. I would, ra- I would, like, to, would like to have waited till tomorrow maybe at this point. But we'd already kind of scheduled to do this today. Yeah. And I think he was busy tomorrow too. But Well, but people the, are using this the studio for – other things tomorrow. And oh, then. that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, the game I'm excited for, honestly, is Florida Auburn mm-hmm. or Florida LSU. I think that's gonna be the game of the week. Uh, what do you think? Oh, uh, Oklahoma's playing Texas. What do you think about Florida LSU? Oh, uh, that's a that's a smash by LSU. No, it's a whopping. No, good old whopping. No, the game I'm no probably whopping. gonna watch is Oklahoma, Texas. What is Oklahoma? What are they Jalen ranked? Hurts. What are they ranked? Four. Georgia four, still three? Four or six, maybe. Is Georgia still three? I think so. Let's see. Yeah, they're three. Ohio State's four. Somebody's five, and then I think Oklahoma's six. Maybe Oklahoma's five. As so it goes, Bama, Clemson, Georgia, Ohio State. You go by AP? Yeah. The college football ranking is not out yet. A playoff yeah. ranking. It's loading, but right now it says Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State's three. Oh. Georgia's. F- oh well, Georgia and Ohio State tied for three. Then LSU, then Oklahoma, Florida seven, Wisconsin's eight, Notre Dame's nine. Uh, Texas is eleven. Auburn's twelve. Oregon's thirteen. It's yeah. just while Trask plays well, I don't – No, like Emory. I think they're going to let Emory shine a little Do bit. Do you think they will? Yeah. Have they said? I haven't really looked uh, at it, but I, don't know. I was watching some of the plays by Emory, and he does a pretty good job. I don't know. Joe Burrow is apparently the second coming of Jesus Christ, so we'll have to <laughs> wait and see what happens. But I'm really just in the Oklahoma-Texas game because none of those teams don't have my defense. Those are going to be all offense. It's going to be Sam Ellinger versus Jalen Hurts, and that's the one I really want to watch. So, Are you proud that you didn't quit when things didn't go your way and didn't win the starting job? 
Perry says, yeah, I'm proud I didn't quit, but I know I wasn't going to quit. I'm not a quitter, never been, and I never will. I did see that as we were about to start. Yeah, I forgot to say that. Look at me. I'm the captain now. Andrew called it, I guess. <laughs> Although yep. he didn't go into the captain quarters and say, yeah, I'm the captain. I knew Perry was going to start. You're lying. <laughs> I knew it. Oh, uh, I did not think he would. They've said a lot that he wouldn't. So it's all I, they got. We'll just whatever. If you enjoyed, th- we're gonna just <laughs> stop this video before Andrew does something he's gonna regret. Uh, uh, I, I I feel like this half of this podcast was us talking about the pay for play thing. And then the it was a little half, more interesting. The second half was like. Well, now we don't know. There's way too many variables going on here as to what's really going to happen. So They're pretty much a new team. We've got a new Miami team coming out. It's a completely different Miami team. It's the new you. Shut up. Not no, the new Miami. <laughs> not again. And then you got Virginia, who's inconsistent. So we'll see what happens. Um, if you all enjoyed this video, leave a like. Um, I'm going to have my Twitter and Instagram link down below. I haven't posted nothing on Instagram yet, but yeah. I really want to get to work on that. Yeah. And then um Perkins M V P. Whatever. Um <laughs> I guess just stay tuned. We were talking about going to the Virginia game. I don't know if we still are. Yeah. I, uh, I, don't I know want if I to can, but I don't know. Tyler if might be able to go. We'll we'll wait and we'll see. Um but if we do go then I'll I'll definitely produce content with myself yeah. and whoever goes with me. And um so just stay tuned for that. We'll definitely have a post game about Virginia because um, I definitely want to talk about this game and what would happen. So Yeah, win um, or lose, there's still a lot to discuss. Yeah, yeah there's a lot, always a lot to lose discuss. Lose or lose, there's a lot to discuss. So, Well, as always, you got anything you got to say? Uh, that matters? Yeah, if, if we lose to Virginia, somebody's getting fired. I don't doubt that. Les Miles already fired his offensive coordinator. Yeah, that's but, all I got to say. All I got to say is I guess go kick.